Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Casper, and you can usually find me at MIT. And I'm excited to talk today about one of the three systematization of knowledge papers that are at this conference. In our case, this paper is titled Towards Transparent AI, a survey on, inner, uh, on interpreting the inner structures of deep neural networks. So uh, the first kind of question to address when uh, looking at a topic like this is what actually is interpretability? And in a lot of cases, like the last talk, it's useful to consider interpretability to have a more narrow definition. But as surveyors of this space, we intentionally define interpretability and understand it very broadly so as to ex include explainability and essentially encompass everything that is helpful for um, allowing humans to come to understandings of what a network is doing in terms of its computational graph. You'll also notice that we're focusing specifically on inner interpretability, uh, which is this term we use to describe inner parts of the computational graph, aka not the inputs and not the outputs. So one of the reasons why we were so excited to approach a survey work on interpretability is because interpretability work is rapidly growing and rapidly becoming much more influential. Uh, in fact, we didn't know this when we were writing the survey, but last month there was a paper and a data set and an analysis released that just consisted of interpretability papers from the machine learning literature. And that data set, which you can uh, find uh, a GitHub, some GitHub resources for, uh, had, a, when it was released, 5,199 different papers inside of it. And given that that was a little, a few weeks ago, it was last month, uh, definitely we expect there to be, us to be well in the 5,200s by now, if not further. So in writing the survey, uh, one of our major focuses as well was on uh, engineering relevant interpretability tools and also AI safety. So uh, let's get into the content a little bit more. So first there's this question of like, why do we care a lot about interpretability? And at the risk of preaching to the choir too much at this conference, I will attempt to engage a little bit with this, with this question because I think understanding it is kind of important. Uh, the key value that we see behind interpretability tools is evaluation. When we design a system in AI, usually what we end up doing uh, to understand and evaluate it is by using a test set. Right? We will take some examples from a distribution of relevance, pass them through the network, see how it performs, and maybe if we want some extra credit along the way, we can also look at how the system is performing on specific examples or types of examples from that testing set. Uh, but there are some troubles with this. You know, one of them is that it causes, uh, it doesn't capture out of distribution failures, kind of by definition. If your model is going to perform poorly on some sort of out of distribution um, uh, data, that is not included, going to be included in your training or testing set. Another problem with testing sets is the active type of harm that can be reinforced by things like data set bias. So as a solution, what we really want is a toolbox of more open-ended tools that are going to help us understand uh, interpret, evaluate models so that we can exercise human oversight. So with that, we have uh, this notion of trying to interpret models better uh, via hu a human understanding. And the advantages to this include what's on the slide. You know, you have open-ended evaluation, detecting deception, cases in which your model may not be doing what you think it's doing, uh, showcasing failure, fixing bugs, determining accountability, improving basic understanding, and also this relatively new term in the literature known as microscope AI which is kind of interesting and refers to this notion of understanding a model well enough to potentially even gain domain insights uh, on the task that it's, uh, it's solving. For example, maybe we could interpret AlphaGo really, really well and become better chess players as a result of it. So uh, what do we do in this survey? Um, ultimately, we have three contributions. First, we offer a survey on 300, uh, over 300 works on inner interpretability. Uh, the second thing that we do is we offer a novel taxonomy on interpretability tools. And the third is that we discuss challenges and directions for future work. In fact, out of this 11 and a half page paper, we um, dedicate three and a half of the pages just to high level thoughts, overview, and sometimes diagnostics of what's happening inside the interpretability field as a whole. So I don't know, I, would, I don't want to be too forward about this, but I think you might be interested in this paper as a survey if you're interested in one of three things. The first thing would be to learn more about what interpretability really is as a field. If you're new to it or you want to understand more about uh, kind of what's going on and what's out there, this might be a really good place to start that gives you a high level overview of what's happening. 
Uh, the second is if you want to learn more about a specific topic interpret and interpretability. So maybe, for example, you want to learn more about feature synthesis or probing or the connections between interpretability and adversarial examples research and or maybe a number of other things. And in that case, we might have a paragraph inside the paper like the ones on the right there for you to uh, get an idea of what's going on in a quick snippet and also uh, hopefully get a handful of useful resources to uh, branch off from. And the third reason you might be interested in a survey like this is if you think about interpretability a lot from a very high level, much like we do. Um, like I said, we have about three and a half pages of uh, high level analysis about like where we really are, what's going on in the field and potential, and including some uh, potential problems with the field. So the substance of this survey is organized into four different sections that correspond to our taxonomy. Uh, we end up organizing interpretability tools at the highest level and discussing them as such based on what part of the network that they target. Um, and there are four types of interpretability tools in this case, which correspond to the four survey sections of this uh, paper. Uh, the first being weights, then neurons, then subnetworks, and then representations. And I think, uh, you know, I'd be happy to talk about any more, any details or any specific methods or any specific papers that we discuss in the survey. Um, outside of this presentation, but I'll probably for now leave the survey contents of this survey uh, right about here, because going into any more depth would mean discussing some of the specific approaches or the specific um, types of research under one of these um, four categories. Instead, what I think I'll use the rest of the um, presentation for is talking about a few like choice high level comments that uh, and conclusions that my co authors and I have reached as a result of doing this amount of survey work and interpretability. Uh, the first is that I think it might be very nice to be aware of some certain common fit pitfalls that like crop up in the interpretability research. Um, a select few of them are listed here. Uh, one of which is a lack of scalability and I don't just mean the type of lack of scalability that you see all the time in machine learning right like it's obviously disappointing when things don't scale up from MNIST or CIFAR 10 to ImageNet or large language models um, and this happens in interpretability but there's another type of scalability problem here that's pretty unique to the field and that is that you know interpretability being a field that focuses on helping humans understand network networks uh, you know often involves a human in the loop and sometimes there have been very impressive interpretability uh, feats that have been accomplished, but only via having a large amount of effort from human experts in the loop. And when it comes to exercising scalable oversight over potentially very large and very complex systems in high stakes settings, which is the type of problem that we usually care about, you know, this is uh, not necessarily going to cut it in the future. So it will be very valuable to work toward more scalable methods of oversight and potentially just fully uh, automated methods of oversight. A second problem with interpretability comes from uh, different types of uh, cherry picking. And uh, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I do this kind of thing myself sometimes, you know. Um, I'm very guilty of making figure one have the most illustrative examples. Um, but in the field of interpretability as a whole, you know, because things are focused on helping humans understand uh, techniques and understand concepts inside of networks, you know, you should be aware of uh, papers that focus on uh, arguments by providing example after examples. So uh, again, be, this is a beware figure one type of thing. There's also a lot of um, examples from the literature of interpretability works that cherry pick tasks or models. You know, this is uh, also related to the comments on scalability. If you have a particular toy problem that an interpretability approach works well for, but it can't scale up to a uh, to more high stakes or more uh, com competitive settings, you know, then that's there's room for improvement. A third trouble with interpretability involves uh, treating hypotheses as conclusions, and the fundamental challenge with uh, approaching and evaluating a goal like a mechanistic understandings of what ne neural networks are doing comes from this difficulty from the fact that there's no ground truth. You know, if I want to understand what a network is doing, and I unfortunately don't have the ability to just consult some sort of oracle other than the raw weights of the network itself, that's going to tell me like what makes an interpretation good or what makes an interpretation one that's going to be useful. So uh, as a result, um, some there's a, a certain tendency in the interpretability literature to sometimes um, look at some evidence and judge 
an interpretability tool based on whether that evidence is consistent with an, uh, a researcher's expectations or whether that ev evidence is particularly lucid or lends itself well to hypotheses from the researcher. And this is very good and this is very necessary, but we need to just make sure to disentangle our hypotheses that result from analyzing interpretability tools from our conclusions that result from applying interpretability tools in useful settings. The next thing that I want to talk about is uh, something that we're extremely excited about, and that's uh, a number of connections that seem to crop up between interpretability and other paradigms of research, including adversarial examples, continual learning, modularity, compression, and biological brains. And the reason we think this is so interesting is because there's a lot less literature spanning any pair of these domains than there is within any one of these, these given domains. However, the tendency for interesting connections or synergies or crossover between methods is one that's almost uncanny. And in fact, we think that a good way to like generate uh, future insights in multiple fields or future method methods that can uh, apply across fields is to look more into the connections between these six areas. Uh, my favorite of these, in fact, is uh, are the connections between interpretability and adversarial examples. So yesterday we had some talks and some points that I think were very good, uh, talking about uh, some impracticalities of the way we usually approach adversarial examples research. So for example, the uh, threat models and the formalizations of uh, adversarial robustness that we usually tackle in the literature are not quite in alignment with the types of robustness we really want to see in real world systems. And um, another issue is that um, attackers don't always use gradients, for example. But uh, from someone who works on interpretability, I will be somewhat of an unapologetic apologist for um, what can be done in adversaries research that aids in interpretability. And in fact, there are four really useful connections that I, uh, I'm extremely excited about. Uh, the first of which is that more interpretable networks tend to be more adversarially robust. Uh, there are a few different lines of evidence that have demonstrated this. Um, but one of the larger ones focuses on how regularizing the saliency and attribution maps induced by neural networks on specific examples also tends to incidentally improve their robustness. Um, a second connection is, that, is the opposite. It's that robust networks are more interpretable. As it turns out, adversarially training your network or using some sort of other robustness technique doesn't just make it more robust. It also has a really interesting tendency to make the inner representations of that network more perceptually aligned with uh, the types of uh, features that uh, humans have high priors on, um, or that humans expect to see. Uh, the third connection is that adversaries can be very useful interpretability tools. Most research in adversaries focuses on very like small norm, uh, imperceptible insidious perturbations that cause unexpected failures in networks. Um, but there's a whole subset of the adversaries research as well that uh, produces perceptible attacks, such as ones based on patches. And we think these are uh, really exciting and really powerful interpretability tools. Uh, a fourth and final interesting uh, connection is that interpretability tools can be used to uh, design adversaries. And this is one way to kind of bring interpretability into more engineering relevance. It's a good type of uh, application to test for, for interpretability tools. If you can show that you understand a network well enough to, to exploit it, as some net, uh, research from the literature has done, you've um, both made a very compelling argument that your interpretation is correct, but also that your interpretation is useful. Finally, uh, one last thing I want to talk about. And uh, if you take away nothing from this presentation, other than like one message and one slide, I'd love for it to be this slide. Um, we think it's time for an engineering paradigm in uh, paradigm shift in interpretability. So for all the work that exists on interpretability, there's a sense in which not all work is that is particularly that productive. Uh, but from first principles, we want interpretability tools to give us insights that are one valid and two useful. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we have all this research, but not very often do interpretability tools make it into the toolbox of engineers and practitioners really trying to like solve practical problems in the, their systems and uh, such as debugging. And it's worth asking kind of like why this might be the case or like what the dynamics behind this, um, this gap between the research and the practice and what we want to do with the research really is. So um, one thing that 
we think that the lack of engineering relevance to the extent that it exists today is connected to is a lack of very rigorous evaluation for interpretability tools in a way that connects them to engineering relevant tasks. For example, uh, suppose that I want to understand a particular neuron in a network and I visualize it like the figure shown on the slide. And maybe this neuron looks like a dog to me. And if I write the paper, if I'm writing my discussion section and I talk about how, oh, I found the dog neuron, I've done it, this is interpretability, uh, not so fast. I think this is more of a hypothesis than a conclusion. I haven't yet really made a testable prediction or done anything scientific. That's a one way of evaluating, kind of intuition-based. A second way of evaluating interpretability tools that goes a little bit further, but maybe not far enough, is to do something that like barely meets scientific criteria. So making a testable prediction and testing it and validating it, but not necessarily doing so, do, doing this with a useful one. So suppose that I have my hypothesized dog detection neuron, and then I pass a validation set through the network, and I find out that this neuron responds more to dog images than to non-dog images. At this point, I've done something scientifically meaningful, but I haven't done something necessarily engineering relevant. Uh, I haven't connected um, this to something of very much importance because simply predicting how a particular neuron is going to respond to images with or without dogs isn't... Um, isomorphic to any type of particularly compelling engineering relevant task. And this brings me to the third and uh, what I would argue is the best standard for evaluation of interpretability tools. And that is to show that a tool is useful for some sort of competitive engineering relevant task. So maybe uh, I, uh, my third and final experiment with this dog neuron is that I ablate it and I find out that the network um, starts mishandling images with dogs in them once the, that particular neuron is gone. And now, uh, we're talking. And one thing about interpretability is that it's very much of a wild west still, and there's all sorts of uh, exploratory work going on. And as a result, there's not a lot of like benchmarking or standardized evaluation techniques to give us clear and consistent criteria for telling when interpretability tools are very useful or not. And uh, moving forward, we think that if you take nothing else away from this paper, uh, we think that one of the most valuable things in the interpretability literature is going to be the establishment of rigorous benchmarking tools that measure the competitiveness of interpretability tools on engineering relevant applications. Uh, this is something that my uh, some co-authors and I have been doing in follow-up follow work. On the bottom right, uh, you can see a figure that I'd be happy to talk more about in the poster session or at some other point during this conference, where we it, um, apply one of these benchmarking approaches based on the rediscovery of interpretable Trojans. And we find a lot of differences between how different interpretability tools perform, but also a lot of it room for improvement overall. So uh, maybe just in the same way that ImageNet catalyzed a lot of useful research on computer vision in the 2010s, we might also see um, uh, a push for more benchmarking in the near future and interpretability uh, help move the field a lot further forward. And with that, I just want to say thanks. Thanks to all of you uh, for sitting through the session. And also thanks to uh, my three very talented uh, co-authors and the institutions that we're affiliated with.